CWPA Remote Professional Edition, where we take a look at water polo players and where they are today. This man was a member of the Johns Hopkins University Blue Jays men's varsity water polo team from 2004 to 2008. In 2013, he received his master's degree in international studies. And now he is a legislative director in the U.S. House of Representatives. We're so very pleased to be joined today by Joe Jankowitz. Joe, thanks so much for appearing today on CWPA Remote. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So how and why did you end up at Johns Hopkins? So it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, when I was in high school, where I went to, uh, I went to high school in Coronado, California and played water polo there for four years, loved it. Um, I thought I wanted to get away from the West Coast, which many people on the West Coast would think that's crazy. So I was looking <laughs> predominantly at East Coast schools. Uh, funny enough, I actually uh, applied to a number of different schools, including Johns Hopkins. And when I got in and decided to go there, I actually had no knowledge of the water polo team. And going into my, in my during my senior year, I, I came home one day to for lunch. Uh, we were allowed to leave campus and I come into the house and my mom goes, so I found out they have a water polo program at Johns Hopkins and I have the coach on the phone and mm -hmm. she handed me the phone. And next thing you know, I had Ted Bresnahan on the, on the phone mm -hmm. going, Joey, we'd love to have you come play water polo for us. <laughs> uh, sounds just like him. Yeah. And basically he let me walk onto the team and I got to play all four years there. And, uh, I really enjoyed it and the camaraderie and the people that I played with. Um, yeah, it was a great experience, but it was a very, uh, happens uh, it was a very interesting circumstance. So I was, that's how I got onto the team. So. Well, what was your very first practice like? The very first practice I remember was actually not without Ted. So we had our hell week or whatever you want to call it before the season started, where we went to Greenwich, Connecticut and uh, stayed at a few guys' houses and played at a number of different pools. And I remember meeting all the freshmen there and along with the upperclassmen and we had our first practice and a few of the freshmen, including some of our higher score guys did pretty well, including myself also though. And, um, at the end of practice their team captains who were seniors, they basically talked about how excited they were to have the freshman class, which I think pretty much all the guys were mostly from California, a few from Pennsylvania. And it was just a great experience just to have those guys kind of welcome us into the team. Um, it was a lot of camaraderie that was developed even without the coach Ted being there. So that was the first practice I remember. And how about your first game? So uh, I was thinking, trying to think about this. I don't really remember my first game, but I do remember our first tournament, which was at the Naval Academy. It was probably the Navy Open. Um, and I specifically remember playing St. Francis. Hmm. Had a lot of big Eastern European guys who uh, were pretty intimidating guys. I don't even remember if we won or lost, to be honest, but I do remember just playing, oh, this is college water polo because these guys were six foot four, six foot five, and making these skip high corner bar in shots that I, <laughs> you know, knew were, uh, obtainable, but wasn't prepared to see it in my first tournament, uh, <laughs> as a freshman in college water polo. So that's, that's the first game I remember though. And, and what is your single best, or if you don't have a single best one or two, uh, best memories of water polo, uh, in the, in the collegiate ranks? Um, I think the easiest one was in this, you know, every year we would go to the, uh, go to California and play at Pomona Pitzer, Redlands and all those schools. But our sophomore year, at least for my class, we went out with the team and we won all four games. Um, and it was the best memory, not only because we won it and it ended up getting us ranked number one in division three water polo for that year. But it was just such a great experience because I'm used to playing in outdoor pools. Mm -hmm. And when I came to the East coast to play, and indoor pools, it, it was a, a bit of a bummer to not have the sun on my face. So being able to go there, play in outdoor pools and really warm weather. My uh, folks from San Diego drove up. My dad brought me Mexican food from my favorite place. <laughs> and we won all four games. And it was just a great experience to be able to be a part of that team that basically, in the end, I, I believe we finished number one in the entire uh, Division Three water polo. Uh, by the end of the season, just because we were, were able to be su su successful against those teams, such as Redlands and everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear about your your reflections, as many as you've got, about your collegiate water polo career. 
it was a great experience. Um, initially when I first was leaving high school, I wasn't sure if I wanted to play water polo, but I'm glad I did because I made good friends. I was able to stay focused because I think water polo always keeps you, you know, it forces you due to the, the hours you have to spend in the pool and the travel you have to do on weekends to kind of be efficient with your time, both for schoolwork as well as for the team. And so it was really fun. Um, I enjoyed every year when we got to go back to California. Um, and then when we were on the East coast, we had a lot of families who, uh, who any of the players, the parents who stayed on the East coast, they would always make sure we were taken care of whenever we go up to Bucknell or Princeton to play in tournaments. If anyone lived around there, they made sure, you know, when we go to dinner that we were all taken care of. Um, so it was just a great experience. And a few of the guys I still talk to, I haven't, to be honest, talked to a few of them, uh, a lot of them over the past few years, but that's just because of life and the busyness of my current job. So. And how about the 2005 team? Are you aware of how special that team is in the, in the Johns Hopkins record book? Yeah, I actually, uh, I just had a conversation with Ted just actually uh, about a week ago and he even remembers it to this day. I mean, you know, we had some good guys on our team, both, you know, Sean McCruz, my class, Chris Emerly, uh, our seniors were really good. We had, um, we just had a fun group of guys who, you know, worked hard, took it seriously, but didn't take it so seriously that, uh, it was kind of detrimental to the team chemistry. And that's, I think that year was probably one of the best years of my collegiate water polo experience. All right. Well, before we get into your current situation, um, tell us about your time as a legislative staff, uh, in the U S Senate. Yeah. So, uh, I worked for Senator Feinstein for, um, 2008 to 2011. Uh, it was an interesting time to be there. It was an incredible experience for a number of different reasons. Um, 2008, President Obama was elected and I was able to attend the inauguration because the Senator was the chairwoman of the, basically the inaugural committee. So to be able to kind of witness that history in the making was incredible, but it was also a tumultuous time, uh, healthcare, immigration reform, uh, stimulus, the Bet Hart bailouts, all those things made it a very uh, chaotic and frenetic time where there was a lot of discord. Um, but it was an interesting experience. I, I really enjoyed working for Senator Feinstein. She's, you know, a staple in California politics and the staff she has around her then, the staff she has around her now, who I work with in my, in my current role in, in the House. Um, they're just really smart, really hardworking people. Um, I pride myself in being a Californian. I, I think a lot of Californians view themselves as hardworking, but also know how to be laid back. So it was, you know, it was stressful, but no one ever got too rigid to the point where you couldn't understand that you were working in the United States Senate doing some incredible work. So that was, that was for three years. I did that and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So for those who don't know, uh, and you can count me in that group, uh, what does somebody in that position do uh, either on a day-to-day -day basis or on a project basis, just kind of give an inside look without, of course, giving away things you can't give away. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, well, I guess, well, first I'll clarify, you're talking about my time in the Senate, in the Senate, yeah. correct? Yeah. So I was a staff assistant and a legislative uh, correspondent. Uh, the staff assistants, you know, like anyone who's, who wants to work on, on Capitol Hill, you kind of have to work your way up. So the staff assistants were the ones who were answering phone calls, going through mail, making sure that um, the front office was taken care of. So when meetings with the senator were happening, you were made sure these meetings were, you know, addressed as quickly as possible so that the senator was able to meet with constituents. Um, which made 2008 to 2011 an interesting time because it was, you know, the election of President Obama. Then the, there was the Tea Party wave. So we had a diverse group of constituencies always coming in wanting to speak on a number of different issues. So as a staff assistant, when you're answering phone calls, you get the best of the calls and the worst of the calls. Um, <laughs> some people loved who your boss was and some people didn't. And you kind of had to, you always had to be professional and make sure you were, you know, being as courteous as possible and making sure their message was taken down. Uh, then when I became a legislative correspondent, that was predominantly behind the scenes in the back office where you're responding to constituent mail, making sure that constituents issues are being heard. And you, you respond on a number of different issues. The Senator had a really strict regimen of making sure that, you know, letters were answered within 15 to 30 days. And so it made, it made it very hard. Um, you know, the example I always give was 
during the healthcare stuff, during the healthcare ACA debate, um, at one point in time, we came into the office with over 60,000 letters regarding the ACA and what constituents wanted to see. So, you know, trying to siphon through that and determine what, you know, what responses to give those can be, you know, daunting to say the least. So it was, it was an interesting time. Um, but those were, that, that's, those are the two positions I had. And um, I, th- I enjoyed them. I, I learned a lot and I think it really helped me set up. It helped set me up for uh, graduate school and then for the, the current job I'm in now. Well, a bunch of phone calls and, and a ton of uh, letters to deal with. Is there one that just stands out? You got it and you just went, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? Uh, yes. Um, you would get some crazy ones. I, you know, I probably would rather not go into the details <laughs> of what the people would say, but it wasn't less, it wasn't necessarily crazy as in like, uh, politics is more of just, you know, things that were said, you're just like, I don't know if this is anything a Senator can resolve or help fix. And so, you know, it, it comes with the territory. That's what happens with, you know, an elected official who's in the public eye, they're bound to just get, you know, people reaching out to them to try to talk to them about whatever they can talk to them about. All right. So uh, obviously you're, you're liking being in the government. Um, how did you end up in your current position? Yeah. So um, I went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins, uh, the School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SICE. And I thought initially I wanted to go uh, potentially go to the State Department or some other government agency. But after doing a number of internships, I realized I think I wanted to get back on the Hill and particularly do uh, national security policy work for a a House representative member or a senator. And so while I, after I graduated from SICE, I was looking for work on the Hill and happened to come across uh, an opening in Congressman Adam Schiff's office. And he was on appropriations committee and he was particularly on the state foreign operations uh, subcommittee, which basically did national security, foreign policy, budgeting, and something I was very interested in. I uh, was lucky enough to interview with the congressman, and I was able to get a job with him. And I've been with him ever since, uh, even as he's made transitions to the intelligence committee, where he's now currently chair. So I've been with him since August of 2014. Uh, he's incredibly down to earth, charismatic, charismatic. Uh, really kind boss. And I, I thoroughly enjoy working for him. He's, he, he's a tough boss in the sense that he, you know, he asks the questions that need to be asked. Uh, so as a staffer, you have to make sure that you have all the answers available and not be able to say, or make up, not say, but make up an answer that, you know, you know, or he know may be wrong. So one thing I learned very quickly on the Hill is uh, if a boss ever asks you a question, you don't know the answer to don't lie. Just say, I don't know. I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good maxim to follow. So again, for the uninitiated, what exactly does a legislative director do uh, in the House of Representatives? Yeah, so it varies office to office, but for the most part, uh, a legislative director in any congressional office basically oversees the uh, legislative agenda for the congressman or congresswoman in their personal office capacity. So he has two roles, basically. Right now, he is, you know, he represents the 20th District of California, which has a portion of Los Angeles, Glendale, Pasadena, Burbank, etc. And he also is chairman of the Intelligence Committee. Uh, what I do as his legislative director is making sure in terms of legislation that addresses the district or as well as the state or any sort of federal bill that really plays an important role in, in affecting the constituents of his district. Um, that we prioritize in and make sure that, you know, his bills that he's trying to push for and advocate for are, are getting through the house and, you know, hopefully passed in the Senate and signed into law by the president. I also kind of coordinate and work with the intelligence committee to make sure that anything that has kind of cross jurisdictional issues, you know, not everything is, you know, classified. There's some, some things that have HIPSI, the house intelligence uh, purview, but, you know, personal office has a stake in it as well. And so I work with the staff to make sure that like, any sort of bills that he introduces as chairman of the intelligence committee also basically gets the attention it needs, if, especially if it's going through other committees of jurisdiction. So I, I manage a few staffers, but I also handle a few issue areas myself for the congressman. Um, some of them can be 
you know, things like finance and economics. Uh, one of the ones that I enjoy thoroughly, which is, has nothing to do with any of my undergraduate or master's degree is, um, he, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA facility in his district. I help work on those issues and basically make sure that the JPL, what the acronym for them, is getting the appropriate funding they can they get in order to basically send things like a Mars rover to Mars, which is what they did a few months ago. And it's mm-hmm. now going to be landing there very shortly. And so I'm making sure the policy is there to make sure that they have the resources they need to do what the scientific community thinks they should be doing. And do you go to the launches? Do you go to manufacturing, you know, stages to see what's going on? Um, I visited JPL a few times, including when the NASA InSight mission landed on the planet, uh, which was basically a mission to drill into the Martian surface and try to determine the temperature underneath, determine if any earthquakes are happening, also to basically help in the long-term goal of seeing if there was there was or is any life or water on the planet. Um, so I have visited them and they've given me briefings and it's, it's an incredible experience. They're the smart, you know, there are plenty of engineers and scientists at Hopkins who uh, impressed me. I was not one of them. And, uh, you know, there are plenty of scientists and engineers at JPL who are, you know, probably former Hopkins and Caltech and other graduates who are just the smartest people in the room. And, my job is to make sure that they have the the resources they need to complete the scientific missions that they're going for. So I have been able to visit. It's it's an incredible facility, and that's like the icing on the cake. I mean, I, I do enjoy doing the other duties that I have, as whether it be you know managing staff and making sure that you know a legislative assistant who's doing healthcare or education or other issue areas are, are basically pushing the congressman's agenda, but also being able to work with other offices to you know send letters to agencies. Um, or, you know, work with other offices to draft legislation that are, we, we deem important for, you know, the district, the state, and the country. All right. Well, uh, as you are well aware, uh, a, a change is coming. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you see that uh, affecting your role in any way? Uh, yes. You know, and I, and I don't say this in any way political, but every administration is different. Um, when it was under President Obama, it was different than when it was under President Trump, and it'll be different under President Obama, as I think it's just safe to say, not only because of the politics, but also just because of just the personalities that are in those offices. Um, so I do think it'll be different. Uh, it's I think the priority, just like it is now for Congress, will be to continue, continue to focus on COVID relief and making sure that we're trying to address both the, you know, the pandemic as well as the economic consequences of having shutdowns across the country. And so it'll change, but it'll also still be the same in the sense of, um, you know, as of now, we're going to have a a Republican Senate. So we're going to have to make sure that we have as much bipartisan support from all, you know, branches within those parties, because obviously the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are, you know, have different views and different, uh, groups within those parties. And so, you know, it, it will be different, but I, there, it's still going to be a lot of hard work going into the next year. Uh, undoubtedly. Well, one question you obviously know is coming is what about you personally, all this experience in the government, Senate level, uh, House of Representatives level, you thinking of someday running? <laughs> no. Um, I, I, I very much consider myself more of a policy person. I like to get in the weeds of things. Um, you know, that being said, I understand I work in the House of Representatives and politics are a part of everything, but um, I, I, I enjoy the behind the scenes much more. Um, there are much smarter, better suited people who can, uh, who can do a better job than myself. And I'm just there to sit, make sure that they know they have all the information they need to, in order to do the job they need to do. So no, no plans and. Eh. I don't see myself ever doing it, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Well, we have talked about your collegiate water polo career, and we've, we've talked about your bit, you know, business career. Um, the uh, uh, thing that I would um, ask is, can you speak a bit about uh, how you feel your water polo career has influenced uh, or impacted uh, your career? Uh, I don't know if in politics is the right word, but certainly in government. Yeah. Um... I think it's helped me uh, in two ways. I mean, both in high school and college, you had to become pretty good at time management. Um, You know, 
where I came from in high school, we traveled a lot and played a lot of water polo. And so it, when you have less free time, you had to be really good with making sure your academic as well as your, your sports career were taking the right, we were having the right priorities. And so the same thing happened with college. One thing I, I really, uh, really liked about Ted as a coach was he always said academics came first and he always made sure that we were doing well um, from an academic perspective. We had some, we had frankly, much smarter kids than me who were getting better GPAs, but I was kind of in the middle of the run and we, we, we did a good job of making sure we always went to practice and we never missed any of those. And we always went to every tournament, but you know, there were a lot of guys studying during in between games when we went back to the hotels. And so that aspect of time management and being able to, you know, manage your time efficiently so that you were able to do everything you needed to get done. The other thing I would also say, uh, that water polo has helped me with is you had a lot of different personalities on a team. Um, you know, you're not always going to get along with everyone on every given, on any given day. Sometimes you're going to have a, a bad day because of, you know, a game or a specific play that took place that, you know, didn't go, to, didn't go to your liking. Um, and so I think being able to manage relationships and making sure that you were accomplishing your goals, even if you didn't necessarily necessarily agree with everyone was something that I think I've been able to take to, you know, working in government, which every day we're always trying to make sure we get bipartisan support and also just support in general from other offices and other and, and, and the different agencies when we're trying to push legislation. And so I think that's something that has been also incredibly helpful is just being able to manage relationships and, and different personalities so that you're never, you're not on the bad side of everyone. Although you're not always going to, you're not always going to make everyone happy, but you know, Congressman Schiff, you know, may, some people may not necessarily agree with this, but I, I, he, he really does try hard to um, have bipartisan relationships uh, with different members when trying to push different pieces of legislation. And it's, it's not always necessarily regarding some of the things you, you know, hear about in the news. There's a lot of bipartisanship be, uh, that the news doesn't like to cover. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, along, along the lines of, of, you know, managing things and situations, have you ever found yourself in a situation either in your Senate days or your House days where you stopped and went, uh, this situation, you know what, I can draw upon this, uh, whatever this is, uh, from my water polo, uh, collegiate water polo career, and then I can deal with this situation. That ever arisen? Yes, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to think of like specific examples, but there are many of times where whether it be when I was answering phone calls with constituents where, where something would get heated pretty quickly and being able to diffuse the situation. Um, I will say that I was probably one of the less uh, hot headed guys on our team in college water polo. We had some guys who, you know, they, they would get angry and you had to kind of control their temper to help them, you know, think clearly so that the game went forward and we were able to get a victory. And so being able to kind of diffuse situations is something that I think I've been able to kind of do in my, in my current role, as well as when I was a staff assistant trying to answer constituent calls when they were not always necessarily the most friendly. So, um, yeah, you have, to, and also being able to think on your feet. Um, sometimes actually a lot of the time on Capitol Hill, uh, you go into your day thinking you're going to be able to get X, Y, and Z done in terms of long-term legislative projects. And then you get six emails and you have to drop everything and basically figure out how to resolve a problem, look into another issue. And, you know, water polo, like a lot of other sports, isn't necessarily formulaic. You have to think on your feet and be able to kind of adjust to different scenarios and situations and whatever the team throws at you. And the same can be said for working in government, particularly politics. Well, often, uh, Interviewers, uh, popular question these days is, is what would you say to your younger self? But in my case, I like to approach it from the exact opposite way. Uh, what do you think that, uh, uh, you know, college Joe Jankowitz would say to you now? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I'm uh, probably, he would say, you know, I'm glad you stuck with the water polo. Um, size and Hopkins offered this program where basically you could apply to do a five-year bachelor's and master's degree 
where after three years of your bachelor's degree, you then go, you would go to Bologna, Italy, and then Washington, DC to finish your master's degree. And you completed in five years. And I, I considered doing it. Um, I started actually the application, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I wanted to complete my college water polo career um, and play all four years. And, you know, I, I think my college self would just say good job for doing that. Cause in the end, I still, you know, I was able to go into the workplace, work for three years, realize I wanted to get my master's still from SICE, apply for that, get in, get that degree and then work for Congressman Schiff. And so that was probably what you know, the college Joe would say to the current Joe is that I'm glad you stuck with it. Um, you know, I, I play with like, well, post pre pre COVID I play, I play with a, a, a master's program here in Washington, DC. Mm-hmm. Some of the guys are from the East coast. A lot of the guys are from the West coast. And, you know, there are, there were definitely days in both high school and college when you're like, you're on your second or third practice of the day. And you think to yourself, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. This is just grueling, but the water polo community is very small. Oftentimes when I would go to even, even master's tournaments these days, I'll still see college um, teammates and we'll just catch up. And it's just great to see them. And water polo kind of brings that camaraderie both in the pool, but also outside of the pool where when you're able to go to a tournament and see someone you haven't seen in four to five to 10 years is an incredible experience. And you're able to kind of reminisce on the college days or the high school days and, you know, get in the pool and then play some water polo again. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully after a vaccine and life returns to normal to be able to play water polo again. Cause it's, it's something that I've come to realize I've been playing it since sixth grade that I, I, I love it and I still love it. And I'll probably continue to love it until the day I die. Great. Well, last question. Uh, watching today, we have high school players and their parents, uh, current college players. And what I think they would really benefit from if you could provide whatever pieces of advice you think are important so that they understand the impact of their college water polo career potentially on their future careers. Yeah. You know, Water polo in general, but also particularly in college, gives you life uh, skills sets that are not easily teachable. And so, you know, there are plenty of people who'd probably say, well, are you going to be an Olympian? Or are you going to go play professional water polo in Europe? And for the most part, a lot of us will say, no, of course not. You know, I, I, I'm a good player, but I'm probably not qualified to go be an Olympian or play internationally. But that doesn't mean that, you know, playing a collegiate sport doesn't have its disadvantage. doesn't have an advantage is I learned a lot and I gained a lot of friends and I was able to, you know, stay in shape and not just, you know, you know, sit in my dorm room and play video games or just study to the point where I, my, my brain would become fried, having that kind of outlet to get the exercise and, and, and make new friends and play, play with different people. And, and to travel around the East coast was an incredible experience that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. And so, you know, I think college water polo had a a tremendous impact on where I, um, where I am today. And so I would just encourage people to view it in the long term in terms of the life skill sets it brings you. Well, he followed up his career at Johns Hopkins by getting heavily involved in the U.S. government. And we've been very happy today to have Joe Jankowitz as our guest. Joe, thanks for providing your insights into how the collegiate water polo experience has impacted your future career. Of course. Thanks for having me. Until next time on CWPA Remote, this is George Gross Jr. wishing all of our viewers the very best in and out of the water.